Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar uh, on the importance of knowledge for high quality instruction during a time of remote learning. I think we're going to have a great discussion today. Uh, we're going to talk both about the importance of background knowledge um, and um, how to continue teaching during this unprecedented period of remote teaching and learning. A couple of uh, housekeeping items. First, you are all muted. Uh, if you would like to say hello or you would like to ask us a question about technical issues or anything like that, um, please uh, do that in the chat. Uh, we will be having a Q&A at the end. Um, for the Q&A, please put your questions into the Q&A area um, to make sure that we see it for the Q&A and we will try to get to as many of your questions as we can at the end. Um, but uh, please put it there so that we know that you want it as part of the Q&A. Uh, now I'd like to introduce you to the host of our webinar, Larry Berger, CEO of Amplify, who will be running our uh, online panel, uh, as well as the Q&A at the end. So thanks again for joining us and I'll turn it over to Larry. Thank you, Kay. Um, delighted to be here and delighted to have this conversation uh, with such noted experts. Uh, I wanted to spend a moment to set up the topic that we're going to be discussing. It's worth pointing out that when we first announced that we would be having this webinar, it was simply called The Importance of Knowledge in High Quality Instructional Materials. And then COVID-19 happened and we made the adjustment to say, let's talk about what I would argue, and I think you're going to hear today, is the heightened importance of knowledge in times of of, uh, of remote learning, uh, as is likely to be the mode for uh, an unforeseeable amount of time. We, we, have, uh, we have a science expert here. If there's time left over, we will ask Susie when we are going to get a vaccine. But until then, um, we have to get ready for a whole new mode of teaching and learning. But it's one that has to draw in all the right ways on proven and trusted modes of teaching. And this issue of knowledge is perhaps the most proven and trusted pillar of learning. And so it is, it's interesting that we find ourselves very often in contemporary American education in a debate about how important knowledge is. There has been an enthusiasm for the idea that there are skills. And if you could teach those skills, comprehension, reasoning, critical thinking, uh, you could actually make people smart and skip the hard step of building knowledge. And that was enormously attractive for a bunch of reasons. Knowledge takes a lot of time to develop. It often starts when kids are very young. It is supported over the course of experiences in the summer. It's, uh, it's supported by parents and caregivers who can talk knowledgeably about a wide range of subjects and a broad a uh, set of vocabulary. And, um, and trying to replace that for kids who don't have that seems like quite a hill path to climb. Wouldn't it be great if you could instead teach a set of school skills that might be developed in the course of a worksheet or a handful of worksheets that would replace some of the cognitive development that would come through knowledge. And so for example, if you could make kids really good at main ideas, but not have to teach them any ideas or the history of those ideas or, or what is the knowledge base from which those ideas mer emerge, that would be great because then they could score well on tests that were testing for main ideas and uh, we, would, we would be able to make educational progress faster. And it is worth saying that over the last few decades of American education, some real enthusiasm for the possibility that maybe we can do that. Maybe there are skills abstracted from knowledge that we can just give to kids They'll get smarter and the hard work of coming up with equitable ways to get knowledge to kids would either be uh, something we could skip or at least postpone. Maybe secondary school and maybe higher ed is the place where you get lots of background knowledge in your chosen field. But maybe we don't need it to get through basic competencies. And this idea has a long history. It's not just uh, a kind of error of the last uh, couple of decades, but it has had a lot of currency in the last few decades. And I think over the last 
I'm going to turn to Natalie at some point soon to get the history right here on uh, sort of when the beginning of uh, a reevaluation of the central role of knowledge became a kind of centerpiece of American education. Arguably, I'm going to say, and then Natalie will have time for a rebuttal, um, you know, the person who was championing this idea uh, going back uh, a few decades was E.D. Hirsch, um, but he was seen as kind of a fringe uh, voice, someone who didn't really understand as much about education as people in education schools did. He was, after all, just a literary scholar. But Hirsch stayed at it, and he actually built schools that operated according to the idea of developing core knowledge, and he built curricula, and, and he proved in research study over time, sometimes comparative research studies looking at American education versus European education, that knowledge was pretty important. And that then got supported by a set of cognitive scientists who said, you know, we don't seem to be able to develop these skills in kids without infusing them with enough background knowledge with which to reason. And, they, and so in all kinds of ways, I think leading up to the current generation of academic standards, uh, knowledge started gaining currency and then became once again a central pillar of what it means to do high quality teaching and learning. And, uh, and as such, a generation of high quality instructional materials, that's become the term of art for them, uh, was developed to make sure that kids were exposed to a lot of knowledge. And not just lots of it, but sequential knowledge that builds and that helps uh, optimize the time it takes for kids to take in and make sense of a lot of knowledge and ideally sequences it so that the tasks they're being asked to do, the cognitive abilities they're being asked to show, have been prepared by the background knowledge that they would need to do those cognitive tasks. And that's a lot of work. Again, it's a lot easier to just hope that the skills are in a workbook. Um, but the people who we're talking with today have experience looking at that as an issue of science and public policy and educational practice. Um, in the case of Susie, has actually built a curriculum that embodies this idea of coherently uh, putting knowledge in front of students and, and building it consistently. Um, and then Alestra has done all kinds of interesting work as uh, one of the best professional learning experts uh, that we had the pleasure to work with. So hopefully in the course of today, we will talk to these different voices to get their take um, about, uh, about knowledge. But I, I'd like to start with Natalie, who wrote an amazing book. I think this is the moment when I'm supposed to hold the book up on the, on, and I do have it here somewhere. So uh, I, I have it. <laughs> okay, you, <laughs> I'm supposed to have the coffee mug, and then I hold up the book. By the way, just to be clear, Natalie didn't ask me to do that. I just have watched enough <laughs> Stephen Colbert that I thought that it was fine. There it is. Uh, the Knowledge Gap, um, and unlike uh, most of those late night shows, I've actually read this book. Uh, it is, um, it, it's, it's terrific. And I, I guess I'd like to start by asking, why did you write a book about it? Well, it was really to solve a couple of mysteries. I'd gotten very interested in education, education reform, and particularly what's known as the achievement gap. Um, and I wanted to know why has it been so hard to narrow this gap? I mean, really, it's, it's either stayed the same or increased substantially, depending on which group of scholars you ask over the past 40 or 50 years. And the other sort of part of the mystery was why things seem to be doing okay, people, kids seem to be doing okay in elementary school, but that it all seemed to fall apart at high school. And uh, what I stumbled upon is very much like what you're describing, which is that we've been looking at this gap as a gap in skills when it comes to reading. And I want to be clear that there, you know, there are decoding type skills, which really are skills. And then there are these so-called reading comprehension skills and strategies, which elementary and many middle schools spend a lot of time on, um, and it, especially in the last 20 years as reading and math tests have become so important because it looks like those reading tests are testing those kinds of skills, right? Um, here, read a passage. What's the main idea? Can you make an inference? And so that's what instruction has come to look like uh, in large part, disconnected 
reading passages. It doesn't really matter what you're reading about as long as you're practicing those skills. And the theory is if you get good enough at finding the main idea, you will be able to apply that skill to any text that's put in front of you. Um, and what I stumbled across, and certainly I was not the first to discover this, as you mentioned, E.D. Hirsch wrote about it more than 30 years ago now, but was that really this is not a gap in skills, but it is a gap in knowledge. It's, you know, background knowledge and vocabulary are not the only factor, but the prime factor in enabling you to understand what you read. So if you're looking at a reading passage on a test and you don't have enough background knowledge to make sense of it, you don't get a chance to demonstrate your skill at finding the main idea. And, uh, you know, the kids who come from essentially families with highly educated parents, families with more resources, have a better opportunity to pick up that kind of knowledge, that sort of sophisticated academic knowledge and vocabulary at home. Other kids really rely on school for that. And if they don't get it there, there's going to be this gap in test scores. Plus, um, there are more assumptions made about how much background knowledge kids have. And if, you know, unfortunately in our system, the kids who need knowledge and vocabulary from school the most are actually the least likely to get it there because those schools are the ones where the test scores are likely to be lowest and therefore they cut out things like social studies and science in order to spend more time on those largely illusory reading comprehension skills so those kids can get to high school with really crippling gaps in their background knowledge that prevent them from being able to do the kind of work we expect them to do in high school. Natalie, can I press on one uh, matter that I think made this knowledge hypothesis that knowledge was central to improving performance uh, a bit politically charged as it was first introduced in the 80s, which is the question of which knowledge? Is this the knowledge of Western civilization? Is this the dead white males? Or is knowledge potentially more broadly defined? What, what does the research say is meant by knowledge? Well, I'm not sure the research is going to give you a definitive answer there. I think the real question is, what do we want kids to be able to understand when they graduate from high school or college? And I would say that in a democracy, uh, it's really important for people to be able to understand the newspaper or magazines, news reports in general. So, I mean, there's a certain core, I, I do think, of references that are and concepts that people need to know. You need to know what the Middle East is, or um, and um, in order to, to really exercise your right, your, your resp responsibilities as a, a voter, as a citizen of a democracy, and also to enable yourself to have a fulfilling life and to you know contribute to society economically and all of those things. Uh, there's no list, though. I mean, there are um, different bodies of knowledge that can be delivered in different ways that will accomplish that goal. And certainly if um, your particular students, if you feel they need a, a additional knowledge, you can always supplement a core a curriculum that covers that core of knowledge. Right. And so. I, think, I, mean, I think one of the arguments that's been made somewhat convincingly is that it's really important that kids understand kings and queens, because otherwise when they read a story about the king and the queen leaving the palace and the princess being sad, they don't know why a princess is sad when a king and a queen leave the palace, unless they understand the, the relationship among those. But the question of which kings and queens, whether they are kings and queens of Africa, kings and queens of Mesoamerica, or the kings and queens of Western Europe, is possibly less important and opens itself up to the possibility that you could learn about all three and should. What I, I like, some commentator whose name I've forgotten has said that the idea is to have enough knowledge that you can have a knowledge party in your head. So, and you know, if you are familiar with the concept of kings and queens, and then you come across, you know, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, you don't have to know specifically about them in order to gain knowledge from your reading, but you do need to know what a king and queen are. Yeah, exactly. So we are now in this time when certain kinds of traditional book learning are complicated because Kids may not have taken the book home and they may not have lots of books in their home. Um, say a little bit about what you think has happened to the role of knowledge in education during this period of COVID-19. 
Well, I mean, I think um, we, we know that the, the knowledge gap has its roots in the different experiences that kids have outside of school in their homes. And of course, they're home now 24 seven. So it stands to reason that those, that gap is widening by the day. Um, and kids are getting different access to whatever schools are putting out, which varies as well. Um, but even you know, many elementary and middle schools that are sending home assignments, and even if kids have access to those remote assignments through the internet or whatever, a lot of those assignments in schools that have not adopted a content-rich knowledge building curriculum are let's practice finding the main idea, et cetera, on disconnected texts. And so that's not really helping either. Um, so, and we also know that this approach of working on comprehension skills at the expense of content has actually uh, been making the gap widen every year that kids stay in school. So the point is, I, I, don't, I think what this crisis means is that we cannot afford to waste any more time in giving access to knowledge to the kids who need it most. Um, so what I would say is, if you are remotely trying to teach a, a, a curriculum that is focused on comprehension skills, as most elementary literacy curricula are, try to, to focus on, ask questions about the content rather than focusing on those skills. Bring in, if you can, some supplemental material to flesh out the often very bare bones informational text that's in those basal readers or whatever. Um, when kids come back to school, continue that and be skeptical about testing their reading levels because that may not really reflect what they can do if they have background knowledge. And ultimately, I would say, you know, I know this is a difficult time for schools, for teachers, for students, but um, I would say if you, your school, your district is not already using a content rich elementary literacy curriculum, now's the time to adopt one uh, and, and prevent further damage and really address those losses in learning that have been occurring not only during this period of uh, when schools are closed, but also that's been going on now for decades. Yeah, it's, um, and say a little bit about like when you've seen this working well, what does it look like for teachers and kids? I mean, there's an argument that says, you know, in the, in the particular knowledge rich curriculum that we published, first graders are learning about Mesopotamia. Why do first graders need to know about Mesopotamia? It's not even appropriate for them to be learning yes. about such a long work. What do you, well, that criticism and, and what do you see in response to that? Um, well, you know, one of the things I did for the book was to follow some classrooms through a school year. Um, one using the sort of standard skills focused approach and, and one using, it happened to be CKLA, Core Knowledge Language Arts, but one of the newer content focused curricula. And that Mesopotamia lesson was one of the first that I saw and the kids were just enthralled. I mean, I would say that um, there is this popular misconception that kids are not gonna be interested in things that are so remote from their experience, so abstract. They love it. I mean, the level of engagement that I saw in classrooms that were focused on content was so much higher than the ones that were focused on skills. You know, first graders, they don't really have much to say about sequence of events or the difference between a caption and a subtitle. They really aren't getting very interested in those things. But I heard amazing discussions going on in first and second grade classrooms when they were learning about things like the War of 1812 or the human digestive system, really, and, and they were so proud of what they knew, those kids. Plus, they were picking up incredible vocabulary. The, the second grade class I followed through the school year, most of those kids were from non-English speaking families, but they were, they were not only learning, but also using words like revenge and opponent and labyrinth. Um, and those words are lodged in their long-term memories for them to draw on in later years. Yeah, and one of my favorite things in these knowledge-rich uh, schools is um, the way that uh, playground play changes. Suddenly they're playing Inca Empire games instead of yes. whatever the game uh, was. And it's, you right. know, one of, the, one of the nice the, the stories that I, I think it, it resonates the most that I heard when I was reporting um, for the book is about, this was a school in Reno, uh, Nevada, where the kids were all from low-income Spanish-speaking families. 
and the school had adopted CKLA and the teachers were a little skeptical, but the, the kids started, and these were kids who really didn't, the a teacher told me they really didn't have rules on the playground. They were just, it was a free for all, but they not only had rules, they had organized themselves into groups of Greek gods. This is while they were doing the Greek myths domain. And uh, so a, a little girl might come up to one group and they say to her, well, oh, you want to be Athena? And we've already got an Athena. If you want to be Artemis, we're good to go. But if you really want to be Athena, there's another group over there that's looking for one. And this really convinced the teachers that they had never seen classroom instruction carry over the playground like this before. So, yeah. Fantastic. So uh, I want to bring Susie in here because Susie has been uh, at the heart of making a high quality instructional materials curriculum. But in your case, it's in science. And so talk a little bit about what this role of knowledge is in the context of science. Thanks, Larry. Uh, so just so that viewers have a little context, I work at the Lawrence Hall of Science. It's a, it's a public science center that's part of University of California, Berkeley. And for a few decades, we've been working on making high quality research based instructional curriculum materials field tested. And so um, in our work, we try to take what we as a field know about science and about teaching and about learning. And we try to translate that into instructional materials that will help teachers support their students in achieving deep and equitable science learning. Um, that, so that's our overall mission. And as the field has learned more about how students learn and what's important about knowledge, we have incorporated that into our work. And uh, for the last seven years or so, we've been focusing on designing a curriculum for the next generation science standards. So those are the new science, new-ish science standards that came out um, in 2013. And uh, thinking about the topic of this webinar, the, the importance of, of knowledge, I think one really important thing that the NGSS did for us as science educators was to collapse a false dichotomy between skills and content that existed in earlier science standards and older models of science education. So um, in the olden days, like, like the 1990s when I started teaching, uh, we had inquiry standards and we had content standards. And what that meant was um, in both our, our teaching and our instructional materials, we often got inquiry without content, so inquiry skills without content. So this is kids you know, designing experiments to test different brands of paper towels. And we got content without inquiry. Um, and this might be you know, kids reading textbook chapters and regurgitating to fill in the blanks in the questions at the end of the chapter. So um, I think what the NGSS has helped make really clear is that neither of those extremes actually involves what we really should think of as knowledge, as real science knowledge. So um, the purpose of science knowledge is to explain phenomena in the, in the universe, in the world. And so if you're not doing that, um, you're probably not actually developing or using science knowledge. And is this, is this what scientists do? I mean, I, the popular image of scientists is they're, they're, they're mixing test tubes, they're doing experiments. <laughs> they aren't like building up their background knowledge or are they? So the, uh, another great thing that the Next Generation Science Standards did was introduce the concept of, of the science practices. So in science, we tend not to use the word skills anymore. Um, in science education, we talk about science practices and that is the idea that these are the things scientists do to build and use that knowledge. Um, so scientists don't in fact just mix things in text test tubes and then from that they understand the world. They also read science texts that other scientists have written. They look at secondhand data that other people have collected. They analyze their data and they make models to try to represent their explanations. So all of these things that real scientists do um, are really part of what science learning should be about as well. And so the science and engineering practices that are part of the NGSS are things like, they are conducting investigations, that can, that can include test tubes if you need them for that, um, but they're also analyzing the data, they're creating and using models, they're constructing explanations, making arguments from evidence. Um, and so the, one of the beauties of the NGSS is the standards themselves are um, a combination of disciplinary core ideas with science and engineering practices. 
So it really, it's a coherent view of knowledge as opposed to trying to separate it out into sort of ideas and skills, but really how they work together. And so in designing uh, a curriculum to make this happen, um, it's, it's science class. And so how much time can you spend on reading and writing? This is the chance to do science, or am I thinking about it? So uh, the, the curriculum we're working on now is built on a program we developed uh, just before the NGSS came out called Seeds of Science Roots of Reading. And it was um, uh, developed with research, with funding from the National Science Foundation to look at how it might be possible to do what we called in those days integrating science and literacy. We don't really call it that anymore because now it's science practices. But um, my director, Jackie Barber, got together with a gentleman named P. David Pearson, who is a very well known reading researcher, um, and he was then the Dean of the Graduate School of Education at UC Berkeley. And they looked at the question of, um, is it possible to teach science and literacy together in a way that's actually more powerful for both of those domains? Um, uh, P. David Pearson says a lot, I think something that's very consistent with what uh, Natalie has observed, which is that um, literacy has been a, a domain in search of content. And um, so he was very excited about the idea of helping kids learn reading and writing in the context of, of science and science knowledge. And my director, Jackie Barber, was um, actually originally just excited to get science into elementary school classrooms because, uh, as Natalie also noted, science and social studies tend to get pushed out. Um, so she thought, okay, well, if we, can, if we can meet teachers' needs to address literacy goals while kids are learning science, maybe teachers will teach science. So that was the original motivation, but um, in fact, what we found, and these are through some gold standard uh, studies, is that the kids uh, actually, when hands-on investigations were integrated with reading, writing, and talking, like scientists, kids actually learned um, science better, they learned vocabulary better, and their reading and writing skills improved as well. So it's actually, uh, we found out a great way to teach science. So you, you developed, this integrated way that brings practices and knowledge and literacy but it really seemed like it depended on classrooms like physical experiments that you get your hands on sitting or standing shoulder to shoulder with your classmates looking at the same phenomena turning and talking all these things that we are now forbidden to do uh, so so what happens to this mode of science instruction when it has to become remote. <sighs> so I think uh, the first thing I want to do is acknowledge that we are all teachers and parents and schools. Um, have been, we're in an impossible situation, a very difficult situation. And there are so many districts across the country that are still just trying to make sure children are getting fed. Um, and so many teachers who are teaching full time while also supporting their own children at home or taking care of their family. So I want to start by saying I don't want to pretend I have answers or best practices, because I think probably nobody has answers or best practices for the situation we are in right now. Um, I think that one thing for us to keep in mind is uh, to try our best not to throw pedagogy out the window. Um, so whatever constraints and limitations we are working with, and those vary hugely across different districts and different families, um, we need to try to figure out how to preserve the most important pedagogical principles uh, as best we can within whatever those constraints are. And that's one reason why it's hard to have um, an answer because the situations are so different in terms of the materials available, whether there's synchronous learning happening or not, whether kids are just getting stacks of paper stapled together and mailed to their house. You know, I don't have a recommendation for an approach that addresses all of those situations, but I think I can recommend some questions to ask ourselves as designers and educators in schools. Um, for science education, I think the questions I would ask are, within the constraints you're working within, whatever those are, are students still figuring out phenomena? Because that is really what um, science knowledge is about. Um, are they still engaging in science and engineering practices to do that? And then there's a third one um, that is so challenging, but so important, which is figuring out how to find ways for students to still engage in some kind of discourse. 
um, because we know that student to student talk is how they make sense of you know, these knowledge sources, these investigations, these wonderful texts. Um, they need to talk to each other to, to build their knowledge, to make sense of it, to understand it and internalize it. And that is really a challenge in remote learning. Um, and so I think we all want to try to help figure out how to support that at home in whatever way possible, whether it's, even if it's talking to your little brother or your dog or your, your stuffed animal, but trying not to give up on that completely, but just try to be creative about how to support it. And I'm, I'm a fan of the notion that the, the very set of things we're trying to figure out now lend themselves to, to a kind of scientific inquiry, which is scientists kick into gear when a, when a phenomenon emerges that they don't understand, that they can't explain, where the knowledge we have previously doesn't quite apply perfectly, they try to figure out what are the experiments, what are the theories, what are the hypotheses um, that might explain this, and, and how can I get some data to inform what I'm doing? And so I feel like I watched a set of schools that pretended on Monday morning after their school closed that they were ready to go and they got on Zoom and they put kids through six hours of, of Zoom whether, whether they were awake or not. And then I watched some other schools that were like, you know, this is a problem. We're not ready for this. Let's figure this out together. And they were getting feedback from kids about what worked for them, when they wanted to do their work, how they wanted to do those, their work. And sometimes those schools looked like they were just sort of going nowhere and, and some of them were. And some of them I think are, have like got momentum now. The kids feel like they were part of a design. They are part of a process of, of refinement and improvement. I guess in some ways it's not unlike the ideas of engineering that you put forward in, uh, in the, the Lawrence Hall of Science uh, curriculum. Yeah, that makes sense. So now I'd love to bring into this conversation, actually I do have one more question for Susan. Um, that bridge of literacy and what we think of as more traditional experimentation and building science knowledge, has that changed? Does it have a particular form that it takes in the era of remote learning? I'll say, um that probably one of the biggest challenges everyone's facing, one of many challenges everyone's facing with remote learning is time and things are not going as efficiently and smoothly as they are and kids can't sit in front of a screen for six hours a day. So the time we already had that was so precious and limited is even more limited. And so I think it's even more important than to build on the synergies um, between areas. And so I think our whole goal of um, designing materials that could get science instruction into elementary classrooms through integrating literacy as well is even more important now. And so I, I really encourage educators as you're making decisions and districts, um, don't throw science out the window. Think about if your kids are reading and writing about science, how you can really um, do double duty and get achieve your science learning goals and your literacy goals as well. And I see one of the teachers in the chat pointing out um, how powerful uh, breakout rooms in Zoom are for enabling the kind of intimate discourse that, uh, that, that science education and all kinds of education allow. And I, I think a lot of teachers weren't using those at first because it's like, well, what's going on in those breakout rooms where I'm not? And a lot of them have since realized that that's where a lot of the action and energy and, and relevance, it's pretty easy to tune out of the Zoom uh, if you're one of 30 kids and the teacher can't really see whether you're there or not, it's, uh, it's hard to tune out of uh, an interaction with a few uh, of your peers. So um, I want to bring Alestra into this. Uh, Alestra is a professional learning manager at Amplify, so she trains all around the country and she is one of the uh, uh, folks who does it in not just in ELA or just in science, but actually trains on both. And so I'm eager to get your perspective. Um, what are the questions that teachers tend to have about knowledge in either of those, uh, in either of those domains? Yeah, so I mean, I would have to piggyback off of a lot of what I've heard Natalie and, and Susie mentioning about, you know, the, some of the, the constraints that they're having in time. Um, and, and how can I, you know, uh, kind of cross-pollinate from what's going on in my ELA and, and 
what's going on in science, particularly, you know, when we think about um, in elementary school, really uh, the, I think some, some of the challenges are, you know, in this remote setting and, and the, the time that people have available for students to be online. And so one thing that I recommend when teachers are saying, I just don't have the time to do all of these different standards. Um, I bring in the work of Tina Chook. She's from Stanford University, and she did a really beautiful job of finding sort of the convergence of um, ELA and science and math, and we could weave in social studies. And so what are sort of those, um, those ways of, of building knowledge um, that are true to all of the disciplines? And the first thing she pointed out was really like content-rich texts like the importance of using across all of those disciplines, content rich text. But in addition to that, you know, are students engaging in discourse like Susie brought up? Are they uh, constructing explanations or building arguments? Are they critiquing the ideas of their peers? And so, you know, when, when I think teachers are up against this sort of, okay, I've got this much time to do what I had so much more time to do before, it's really finding that, you know, that convergence can be key. And, and say a bit, sort of in some ways independent of the particular time constraint now, mm -hmm. you are often presenting, if you're teaching from uh, teachers how to, how to think about and, and use one of these curricula, you're presenting uh, a theory of the importance of knowledge that sometimes runs up against what they were taught in ed school what they learned from their peers in that school um, and sometimes also like deep experiences of what what lights up the eyes of kids and they're like hey it's it's the magical stories of animals in you know on a farm it's not Mesopotamia how, how say a little bit about what those questions are because many of the people listening may be somewhere in that journey um, yeah. What's the pushback? What, what do they wonder about? Well, it's interesting. I, I mean, a full disclaimer, um, I did start off as a member of Susie Loper's team at the Lawrence Hall of Science. And I remember as I was there as a, as a literacy specialist, um, I, I was introduced to the work of Shanahan and Shanahan. And what they really did was they turned this idea of disciplinary literacy kind of on its head. And instead of saying, well, first we have to get the kids to learn to read before we can, you know, even think about them reading to learn. And what Shanahan and Shanahan did is they, they, you know, with extensive research found that no, as students are being exposed to Mesopotamia <laughs> and, you know, texts of all of these different uh, ideas that bring light into their eyes, they're also learning these skills, but it's not, uh, as Susie had mentioned, a false dichotomy. It's these things are integrated. And as we are gaining or building our knowledge, um, we're also learning those essential practices um, simultaneously. Now there's, there's a, um, as I said, there are some schools that sort of rolled out, uh, we're gonna do Zoom, you're gonna <laughs> teach science for a certain number of minutes, mm -hmm. and I don't have any of the stuff to do science here. Uh, so I'm just going to lecture you, um, and feedback on that has not been great from kids or even from the teachers who have to do it. They're like, this is not what I wanted class to be. What are you seeing? What are you hearing about teachers who are figuring out how to make this work? And especially to the extent that it's, it's about making the, the knowledge rich nature of these curricula. Uh, uh, well, one thing, you know, I think that this is bringing out for all of us is just that importance of partnering with families, um, you know, and, and for students to really uh, have sort of some collaboration in their household. So one thing we've done, um, because we are finding that this is a challenge, is we've provided home investigations. So here are some things we can do to not only recognize that there are funds of knowledge that students have from their households, but you know, to really leverage those. So for example, a home investigation, a student might be invited to do um, a phenomenon-based you know, um, investigation and get partner with their siblings or partner with a, a guardian and let's you know, um, figure out this phenomenon together. Let's gather evidence collectively 
um, in our households. So bringing in sort of some support for the learners so that they are building that knowledge um, in this remote setting. Um, it, it, it can be challenging though. I mean, the, I think the simple answer is um, people can rely on, well, what is the simple thing to do to send something out? Like you were talking about worksheets or the old ways of reading a text and answer these questions. But I find that nobody's happy with that. Teachers don't want that to be their model. They've come too far from that. Um, families, you know, d don't see their children being engaged and students, of course, would protest. That's not, you know, how they want to be building their knowledge. Yeah. And of course, this is not the only way we want to learn as adults. We, we, uh, we wouldn't mind a chance to be uh, in the same space figuring things out with, with folks. Um, I want to make sure that we get questions from the audience because I am seeing a uh, wonderful discussion and debate in the, in the, in the chat. Um, but I also know that folks have been placing questions in the, the Q&A part of your Zoom interface. So if you've been actively asking questions in chat, that's great. We will try to capture those and respond. But the place where the, our panelists will actually answer questions is, uh, is if you place them under Q&A. And I can tell already, I'm not gonna be able to get to all of them, but uh, let's get started. Here's the basic one. Uh, Natalie, what's the most effective balance between teaching content and teaching skills at the elementary level? Is it, is, you know, it's gotta be some of each, what's the balance? Well, first I'd ask what, what we mean. I mean, the word skills covers a lot of things. And if we're talking about foundational skills like phonemic awareness and phonics, um, those need to be taught directly and explicitly as skills. Doesn't really matter what the content is. But if we're talking about supposed skills like anything from finding the main idea to critical thinking, those are, you know, the research shows those are not skills that really can be taught directly and transfer. They really are very dependent on the context. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't mean that we should never ask students what the main idea is or if they can determine cause and effect, but that those abilities are going, they're not really skills, they're more like habits, I think, and we need to foster them, but we need to foster them in the context of knowledge, putting the content in the foreground and so, for example, the second grade classroom I was following, um, where they were studying the myth of Daedalus and Icarus, and the teacher might ask them to make a prediction about what, what is Daedalus's plan, what's he going to do next, or what was the cause and what was the effect here. But she wasn't trying to teach the skill of making predictions or the skill of determining cause and effect. She was using those things to get kids to think deeply about the content, and in the process, they were learning how to do that, how to connect different bits of information and getting into the habit of doing that. And we're motivated in doing so because they've gotten excited yes. about that. Yeah. Yes, very motivated. That's the, that's the key thing. Um, a version of this question for Susie, which is uh, one, of, one of the uh, participants asked, if you never separate skills from content, could that weaken the skill levels attained because you're just not getting enough practice with the discrete skills? And I guess a uh, part of that is the question, are the science practices the same thing as what we used to call skills, but just given a fancy new name, emphasis? What's the difference? All right, let me try to see if I can talk about both of those. So um, first of all, to be clear, uh, there's a difference between separating skills and content and um, teaching skills or practices or um, explicitly in the context of uh, investigation acquiring knowledge. <clears throat> so we definitely think that students need explicit instruction in science practices and in the related skills or habits of um, you know reading and writing like a scientist, writing explanations, um, reading science texts, things like summarizing, you know, making connections. So we really believe that students need explicit support in learning how to do all those things. So I think we're not, it's not that we're ignoring it or just thinking it will be, it will happen if students engage with the content. 
but it doesn't make sense to separate it as an isolated skill. So I think that's what we're advocating for is, is explicit instruction and support for practices or skills or whatever you want to call them, but always in the, in the authentic context of figuring out scientific phenomena. And, um, and so, yeah, and Kelly, I want to, I'm going to come back to the, what's the difference? But sure. I, I want to come back to this question that I'm seeing in the chat. And I think, I think it's, it's constantly on people's minds when they come to this, which is, I get it. That would be beautiful if we were like helping kids think and build knowledge. But there's a test coming up which has main idea questions on it and sequencing questions on it. Like, shouldn't, like, and I got to get those test scores up. And are you really saying that this knowledge rich exper ex experience is going to deliver the test scores? Or are you just saying it's a nice thing to do? Natalie, do you want to go first? Are you directing that to me or someone else? I want to actually, I'd love to hear both of you answer. <laughs> Well, I do think we have a problem uh, with tests in this country, specifically re standardized reading tests, because they're not tied to any particular body of knowledge, and they look like they're trying, they're testing these free-floating skills. Um, and so your kids could know a lot about Greek mythology and the human digestive system, but then the passage on the test at the end of the year is about the Inuit or Amelia Earhart, and they may not have acquired yet enough background knowledge and vocabulary to answer those questions because they, they don't understand the text. It's not that they haven't had enough practice in main idea or making inferences. Um, so I, I think it's unfortunate. It, it really does interfere with teachers' desire to build kids' knowledge that um, these tests are not connected to the knowledge they're building. Um, I know Louisiana is experimenting with a new kind of reading test that actually is tied to the content, not just in the ELA curriculum, but also in the social studies curriculum. And I think that is a very hopeful sign. But I think in, in the meantime, um, just, you know, I, I do think you kind of have to have faith and I hope that, that administrators and policymakers will also come to recognize that we're not really testing skills with those tests as much as we are testing whatever knowledge kids just happen to pick up and that's gonna be unequal. I, I think that's a great answer. I would also say that, that there's a growing body of evidence that just like you will do better on those tests, even if they're about Amelia Earhart and you studied Sojourner Truth, you, you understand what it's like to read a biography and what it's like to try to figure out a life. And it turns out it's transferable. And while I don't think like the, the um, scientific sense of consensus is complete about that, there is a lot of hope that actually the way you build those skills and main ideas, like I, I'm pretty good at main idea questions, but if you put me in front of a passage of theoretical physics, which I know nothing about, I can't tell you what the main idea is, despite how good I am at elementary school main idea worksheets. So there's something going on. You have to know something just as much as you might need certain cognitive abilities to, to do. Yeah, and, and there are some promising test scores out there. I just don't think we can put all our eggs in that basket because it's, it's just not, there's no guarantee. And Susie, do you want to weigh in from the point of view of, of a rarely tested but still tested subject like science? Rarely tested and then um, next generation science standard assessments are really new and barely exist, uh, don't exist in most states, barely exist in a few states. So I think the uh, assessment developers have been trying really hard to develop assessments that do authentically test this um, three-dimensional, you know, knowledge and practices together kind of learning. And so hopefully the, the, the test will, ref, you know, end up reflecting that and sh showing that if students learn in this authentic way that it will also result in good test scores, but I think it's a little too early to tell. And I guess the point that I hope we're all paying attention to is there, in case you haven't heard, there isn't going to be a test this year. <laughs> and I predict, don't hold me to this, there isn't going to be a test next year, a test next year either. And the reason for that is there's going to be too much variation in the context of how schooling happened for different kids. I think we probably will experience widespread school closures on and off and people will say it's not really fair to, to test. Who knows, but, but um, I think we have, because there was no testing this year, we have some room to experiment. No one's gonna be comparing to last year's test scores as in, in the next school year because we didn't have last year's test scores. So if you ever wanted to experiment with what would happen if we went deep on knowledge and intellectual experience 
and shallow on practicing those type, those item types, practicing on test prep, this would be the year to do it. And my hunch is that the kids who get educated that way will actually do even better on the test as well as having learned to be curious. All right, here's one. Um, and I'm gonna try to send this one to Alestra, uh, but I'd, I'd really like to hear, um, uh, you know, I think probably Natalie on this one too, because I'm sure you got uh, this question. Um, this, this value of there is core knowledge, there's stuff that people in power in our society know, and we gotta make sure that all kids get access to that. I, I wanna point out that that's a social justice argument. It's not always how people talk about it, but if you listen to what Edie Hirsch was saying and what those of us who are excited about this movement now, it's that. It's, it may actually sometimes be Western civilization knowledge, but powerful people have it. And if you wanna be one of those powerful people, we gotta get this key. There's another argument that's also a social justice argument, and it's the one that, that speaks from a place of culturally responsive education, that kids come with a set of knowledge from traditions that are not the colonizing or Western tradition. Uh, they, they have different kinds of pride and motivation around uh, cultures that they may relate to or may look like them. Um, and that there's work to do to, to make sure that the knowledge that makes people powerful today isn't necessarily the only knowledge that makes people powerful in the future. And so when you hear the question, as I'm sure has come up, mm -hmm. I'd like to do core knowledge, but I, I want to start from a place of cultural responsiveness. What, 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 how does that conversation work? So I would say it's not an either or, it can be a both and. Um, I think that that's the best way to approach it is that we don't have to deny the background students are coming with. We can honor that, we can recognize that, we can celebrate that. And then we can also expose them to you know, deep content and uh, enthralling um, ideas that they will gravitate towards and make some of those connections. Oh, like you were saying earlier, the Incan, you know, empire, and now I'm look, I'm learning about another um, version. Uh, there's, you know, there's really we we don't need to put those constraints upon ourselves or our students, but really just open the world of possibility to them would be my response. I don't know, Natalie, if you had something you wanted to share. Um, I would just make two points. One is that some of the knowledge we're talking about is not owned by anyone. Some of it's very basic. So they're, you know, I, I've talked to teachers in high poverty high schools uh, and who have told me they've had kids at all levels of ability, but it's not uncommon to have kids coming into high school who don't know the difference between a city and a state or a country and a continent, can't find the United States on a map of the world, can't find their hometown on a map of the United States and don't have a sense of historical chronology. Um, and that, you know, I think it, we should not be withholding that kind of knowledge from any kid and it, it can be taught in different ways. I mean, we, I think we can all agree, you need to know the difference between a city and a state. Um, and the other thing I would say is, yes, it, it is, kids need to see themselves and what they're learning as well as seeing others, you know, that mirrors and windows uh, metaphor. Um, I think, you know, it's really when kids are older when they're in high school that they really start asking, well, what does this have to do with me and my life? When they're young, when they're in kindergarten, first, second grade, you give them a good story and they're yours. And um, you can convey a lot of knowledge that may not have to do with their particular lives. And in it, when it's done in an engaging way, they're actually painlessly, enthusiastically absorbing a lot of information that will help them in years to come. Susie, do you want to add anything to that? Debate. I mean, one of the things that the Lawrence Hall of Science has been acclaimed for is putting as diverse a face on science as possible. Um, but but say say a little bit about that because of course a lot of the scientific tradition is a Western tradition, but not all. Of it. So so say a bit about how you guys handle. Um, I mean, as as both Alester and Natalie said, it's really important for students to see themselves. Um, and in them in when they see scientists and engineers portrayed and to feel like they can become that person 
we had a great experience uh, in the last couple of years of working um, with the state of California who in their framework, their, their California science framework had a very explicit requirement for all science publishers of representing, not just representing diversity, but representing um, a broad range of types of diversity, including sexual orientation, gender identity, disability. Um, and so it was really great to have that actually be a requirement that we had to fulfill in our program. And we worked with some wonderful organizations to help us figure out how to represent those kinds of diver diversity authentically and respectfully all the way from kindergarten up. Um, so I think those are important things to, to consider. And then the, just the other thing I would add is that um, on sort of the other, the other topic of you know, how does this connect to students' lives and how do we build on the background knowledge that they have? You know, all students have tons of background knowledge. It is about different kinds of things, some of which we as, you know, middle-aged people could not begin to comprehend. Um, so our, our huge challenge as educators is to try to connect what they do bring, of course, to some of the things we think are important for them to learn. And we, sometimes people say, oh, kids don't want to learn about, you know, um, channels on Mars or, a moon of Saturn because that's not connected to their everyday lives. And that's not the experience we've found. We found that kids can get really excited about things that are outside of their experience, um, but you do need to help them bring the expertise that they have to those, to those areas. And that's not, not easy or trivial, but something I think we're all working together on. This has been uh, an amazing opportunity to talk with a set of remarkable experts in the field. I know that I have learned a lot. I know that you guys have increased uh, the knowledge uh, that, we, that we have. Um, and I, knowledge takes time, but uh, I told I have permission to give each of you guys a little 15 second uh, sound bite if you're, if you're ready. And I'll turn off this phone. Um, about uh, knowledge and high quality or about remote learning. Uh, Natalie, I see you leaning in, so you're going to get called on first. Oh, you're on mute. Uh, so, so, but maybe that's because you need a little time to think of your final 15 we, we, I can't quite hear you. Are you talking to me? Oh, or uh, let me just, I think what just happened. Let me try this again. I think maybe my sound was going into a phone. <laughs> Uh, so I was going to ask you guys a really hard question, but the clock is ticking. So my final question is just, you've got one more soundbite to get on the evening news. Uh, what do you want to say about knowledge or remote education, uh, science or literacy? Natalie. Well, I guess I would just say that um, to say we, we have to choose between knowledge and skills or that it, we have to figure out how to balance them is kind of a false dichotomy because when we're talking about comprehension skills or analytical thinking skills, the only way to get there is through knowledge. Um, we can't, it's not just dumping facts on kids, it's giving them information and guiding them to think about it in a way that helps them understand and analyze. Awesome. Susie. I saw in the questions that someone asked if I would repeat the three things I said were important to uh, ask yourself and thinking about remote learning. So I'll just do that, which is um, are students figuring out phenomena because that is what science knowledge is all about. Are they engaging in science practices to do that. And then my last point was figure out a way for them to somehow engage in discourse in whatever way that's possible in the remote learning reality. And the last time. Yeah, and I would just um, say that it doesn't have to be a choice, you know, really thinking about some of the convergences of your literacy and your science and your social studies and your math um, can really uh, be helpful during this time. Thank you, Lester. And my final tip is, if you haven't read Natalie's book, quarantine is a great time to, to read it. Uh, and with that, let me invite uh, Kay back up. Um, just to wrap things up and tell folks where, where they can find the resources that we talked about today. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, we will be um, sending out a recording uh, of this. So uh, a few people asked about that. So you'll get a recording um, and we'll also be sending some other resources related to uh, the importance of background knowledge. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll also be uh, doing a webinar in, in the next couple of weeks about CARES Act funding and how to use it to, to help um, close some of the, the COVID slide that happened in, in early literacy. 
Um, so we'll, we'll send information about that as well in the, in the email follow-ups. But thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you to our speakers for uh, all of your, your wisdom and uh, insights. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, thanks again, everybody. And have a, have a great evening. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.